Santi. We are live for our DC preview. I get to be on location in a site that has absolutely nothing to do with St. Louis City at all, but we're, we're going to make sure we get a flyover in. We've got to get our preview in. Let's do it. All right. Let me get this going over here on the Instagrams. You know, this could be one of those fun, uh, fun live shows because why not do a live show? You know, I always figure, uh, let people see if something happens, but it could definitely be one of those where, uh, a sleeping, potentially sick kid causes a, a little pause. So mm. if, uh, if I have to, if I have to run for a second, um, I'll try to mute myself if I need to do that. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> um, I hope, uh, we're also okay on my side with the dogs. Um, last time on, I check on them, they were sleeping, but you never know let sleeping dogs lie as they say yeah all right you ready yep welcome in everyone to flyer footy my name is matt baker here as always with my friend in soccer santiago beltran it's just the two of us today we're here to preview dc united coming to city park bringing some familiar faces bringing some friends with them that that we know and love very well we're going to preview it all tonight. Santi, how are you and how are you looking forward to this match? Doing great, Matt. Uh, looking forward to City uh, playing at City Park again. It's been uh, too long, uh, at least to me, uh, two away games and now back to uh, City Park and it's still undefeated. So looking forward to hopefully extending that streak. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? I realized the other day we've gotten four matches in. We can now say that, and, and hopefully this progresses through the weekend, but City has now gone back-to-back -back seasons without losing a match in their first four games. I hope we have the same kind of thing coming up this weekend, but that's kind of a crazy stat if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you compare this season to last season, like I did it in different ways, but it's still mm -hmm. uh, four games undefeated to to start the season. That's that's some consistency there. Yeah, unbeaten is as as good as anything early in an MLS season. That's for sure. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. We do have some unfortunate injury news to talk about. Uh, some aspects, it's getting a little better, and I think overall the prognosis is trending. Uh, better than it was last week, I think. So let's chat about some of those players that are maybe available this weekend and definitely won't be available. So first up, Jabulu Blome. He's been out for about three games, I believe. He's trained all week. Carnell said he's had good consistency in his loads, and he's an option. Now, you were there at the press conference. What did you What did you think about what Carnell had to say about Jabulu Blome? And do you really get a sense that we might see him this weekend? I think he he will at least travel with the team. Uh, he has been training, as as you mentioned, uh, last week. He was also um, getting there at the end. Uh, he um, he wasn't with the team, but um, I think he will at least travel. I don't think he will start. Although we were surprised, I think it was a couple of times last year. At least one I remember with. Um, Rasmus Alm, that when he came back, he was as a starter and, and played, uh, I think he played the 90 minutes or most mm -hmm. of the game. But um, I just don't know with, with Blom uh, if they will uh, just like slowly get him back, like 15 minutes, uh, 30, 40, and then um, depending on what's going on, he will start. But I think he, he will be with the team. Um, we'll see if, if he makes an appearance on Saturday. And it, it's a midfield that I guess we kind of need Jabulu Blom. Uh, the depth is being tested still. Edu Leuven is going to be out again this weekend, but the prognosis is trending positive. Bradley Carnell said he's been on a couple of runs and progressing well, quicker than expected. He's coming along really well, and for him to be jogging at this stage is encouraging. And I think that was kind of my silver lining on the Edu Leuven injury, is that when that first two weeks we'll reevaluate came out with Carnell last week. Everybody immediately thought Klaus. Okay. We, we saw that we <laughs> yeah. heard the same thing from Klaus last April, two to four weeks. We'll reassess. Suddenly he's out till after league's cup, but Edu Leuven last year, he, he had, a, I believe a four to six week tag on him for his quad and he was back at four weeks. So whether it's Edu Leuven's body has an ability to bounce back or one of those just intangible qualities, it seems like whatever happens with Leuven, whatever he picks up, he has a propensity to fight off quickly. Leuven coming back, Tim Parker, we heard last week, he didn't, he didn't play. He was a surprise 
um, inactive against the Galaxy last week. Still managing his back is what Carnell said. Doubtful he'll be ready for Saturday, but do you did, do you think do you think both of these players are in the same trending positive, or is is Leuven trending positive and Parker's a little bit more unknown? I think Parker is more on the unknown side, uh, but Leuven, the news we got today were were positive, although Carnell caution uh, it's uh, still early but uh, yeah. it, it's encouraging that he's out there uh, d- making a couple of runs and and doing so work so hopefully uh next week uh will be similar and he will be closer to being back with the team but yeah i don't think uh neither Leuven uh, nor parker will be on the game day lineup on saturday significant misses for st louis city that's for sure a couple of the big game changers that we have on our squad but as, as we're going to discuss here in a little bit, DC United is also going to be coming a little shorthanded into City Park, partially of their own doing, partially where the benefit beneficiaries of an international window occurring. But we'll get into all that in a minute. Let's look at the overall preview of DC United. We know coming into this where St. Louis City stands, we're currently tied fourth in the West, 1-0-3 record with six points, a plus two goal differential. We've scored eight goals on the season. Our form in the last three games is, like we talked about earlier, unbeaten. But we've got a couple draws mixed in there most recently, 2-2 against Austin and then against the LA Galaxy as well. So coming into this, returning home to City Park where we have had uh, more success comparatively, I think it's a good thing for St. Louis City regardless of the players we have available. DC United coming into this currently ninth in the East with a 1-1-2 and two record, one win, one loss, two draws. Five points and a zero goal differential. They've scored six goals. They've allowed six goals. Their form coming into this, they had a great 3-1 win to start the year. Christian Benteke, their striker, Premier League experience, had a hat trick against the New England Revolution. But since then, they've had a couple of away draws to the Portland Timbers 2-2, to FC Cincinnati 0-0, before last week's loss to Inter-Miami 3-1 at home. DC has looked pretty good. They've had no real trouble scoring goals so far this season. And so we reached out, Santi, to a couple of our friends in the DC area. Cheyenne at Between Clean Sheets, that's BTWN Clean Sheets on X, says that United's high pressure approach is new this season. And so far, it seems to be going well. They had a busy offseason. And among their fresh faces, coach Troy Lassen has definitely made the biggest impact. From our friend Jose Mauricio Umania. He's a journalist from WTOP out in DC and he co host of the Bad Hombres FC podcast. He can be found at Jose underscore M underscore Umania on X. And he says that DC United has adjusted well to what head coach Troy Lassen wants to implement, which is a high pressing strategy that creates turnovers in the middle of the field. Unlike the last time they tried this type of strategy in the 21 22 season, this one is much more reserved and comes with a structured backline, which is something that United lacked last season. So as we as we look to what their kind of feedback is and from what we've seen with DC United so far this season, what do you think about their club overall? Just some high-level thoughts about DC United. Yeah, obviously it's a club that has a new coach and uh, is trying to implement a new style of play. Uh, they... They made a lot of changes with the roster and uh, they had a lot of players that uh, that were um, the contract wasn't renewed or options not exercised. And uh, they also brought uh, some uh, new uh, good talent, um, including uh, Jerry Estrada and Lucas Bartlett. But um, so far, what I have seen from them, um, it's um, it's impressive. And uh, and uh, Shijian mentioned that um, the biggest acquisition was um, coach uh Troy's Lesson and and I agree like um he he has been around for a while this is her first uh head coaching experience if you don't count last year that he was uh basically like that interim tag but um mm-hmm. he has experience in USL and had some success with uh New Mexico United and um it looks like what he's trying to implement so far uh, is working um I had I I Caught a couple of interviews that he he gave um, like in the last couple of months, and uh, it just sounds like the way he talks and talks about um, three like like you know Carnell like gives a lot of importance to the personal side. Like mm-hmm. he he's he's like the same. Like he said, like yeah, these are players, but it's important to 
get to know the person and understand them. So to me, it, it looked like a similar approach. Uh, it looks like um, his arrival has really motivated the players and even the, the new players that have arrived. Uh, but I'm looking forward to this one just is because be, just because it is two new coaches uh, going against each other, each other um, the styles that are a little bit similar. We're going to get more into that, but uh, it'll be an exciting game. And that's another underlying story here in this whole match. You know the Lucas Bartlett, Jared Stroud return to City Park. That's going to be the big, the A, the headliner story that comes into this. But Troy Lassen, Bradley Carnell, both of the New York Red Bull system, coming into this as Carnell, his second season, uh, Troy Lassen as his first full year as an MLS head coach. He signed a three-year deal, so he's been given that that backing, that confidence booster from DC United saying that we want to give you time to build the squad that you want to implement the style you want. And then so the first four or five games aren't going to make or break Troy Lassen, but we're starting to see some consistency in what to expect from a Troy Lassen team, namely the high pressing system. So we've heard, we've, we've heard that people have been impressed with DC United's attempts to create some attacks with others besides Christian Benteke uh, using the wide lanes. Alex Bono at goalkeeper has been impressive, but Bradley Carnell said it himself that both teams are similar style-wise. They, they go for intense turnovers high up the field, and that's one of the hallmarks we've seen. DC United's style of play is high-pressing nature, with DC statistically being the best pressing side in MLS currently as we sit going into uh, match day five. And a lot of this comes from Lassen's time with the Red Bulls, that high-octane pressing. They're looking to put the opposition under immediate pressure. It's one of the big key principles of the Red Bull style that is just permeating through all of its students. Carnell is one of them. The possession game, the, the analytics behind how this press is implemented is fascinating to me because we saw last season with Bradley Carnell's side, they did not want the ball. They were very... They were lacking success when they had greater than 50% possession, and it was clear they had one way they liked to win, and then this way was attacked later on in the season. This year, Bradley Carnell has shifted, and he's shown a little bit more comfortability in possessing the ball, a little bit more willingness to, to work on the ball as opposed to just against. But early in Troy Lassen's time here, Santi, we're seeing a DC United team that through their first four games has had possession numbers of 53%, 58%, 42 and 48. Bradley Carnell's side has already dropped below 40% twice this season, but Troy Lassen's side seems more than willing to build out of the back if they need to. They're willing to work the ball high up the field, even if some of the underlying metrics really show that they love that press. They love to move the ball up the field. These two teams are very similar in a lot of ways that the underlying analytics support. St. Louis being the lowest in sequence time in MLS, their, their time per possession is the lowest. DC United is the second lowest. St. Louis has the fewest passes per sequence. DC United has the third fewest passes per sequence. St. Louis is the quickest direct speed in all of MLS. DC United is the fourth quickest in direct speed. Neither team likes to have these huge passing sequences. St. Louis has the fewest 10 plus offensive passing sequences in MLS and DC United has the fourth fewest. So knowing all these numbers, what are we supposed to really read into it about, you know, is this a, who's going to win out? Is it a, we're, we're willing to let you work your style because we think we can beat you on the ball. How, how do you see this playing out with both teams loving this high press, uh, low sequence time? Yeah, definitely the first 10, 15 minutes are going to be key um, with each team uh, working on that high press. But uh, it's, it's difficult to to imagine how this is going to go just because it's two teams that like that high press. Although you mentioned the um, the possession uh, with this United having a little bit higher uh, in that 50% range. And that's something... Um, that caught my attention uh, on one of those interviews. I mentioned that uh, I listened and I trolled this and said, yeah, I like a vertical team. I like the high press, mm -hmm. but at times, if we have to do it, we're going to be patient and uh, play horizontally, create a space. And um, even though a lot of these statistics that you mentioned uh, show uh, like, lo like uh, low uh, pass sequences and things like that, um, at times they can work with the ball. So I think we're probably going to see 
a mix of that uh, for DC United and and maybe City will be forced to do that depending on on what's going on during the game. But uh, yeah, two very similar styles. Um, a lot of the, a lot of it will be about the energy both teams um, start with start the game with and uh, see who can prevail and maybe a score early and that could change the game after that. And that really did seem like the way Bradley Carnell was approaching it. You know, in the press conference on Thursday, he did have a lot of almost intangibles. It, it's going to be who's able to dictate early on, who's able to be the most intense. So knowing that both teams like to do similar styles in their defensive approaches, um, it's, it's who's going to be able to be more successful, who's going to want it the most. And it's not just the the defensive side of the ball that both teams are similar in it's offensively offensively both teams will shoot the ball a lot you can expect more than 15 15 shots by each club in this match where dc united's averaging 17 and a half shots st louis is averaging 16 and a half shots on target 5.8 for dc 5 for st louis you're seeing a lot of similarities in the amount of chances that are created. You're seeing a lot of similarities in the overall number of key passes that occur, those passes that lead directly to a shot. DC United being fourth, St. Louis being fifth in the league, respectively. Shot creating actions per 90, a, a stat that I really like, that tells the two offensive actions that lead to a shot, whether it's a pass, a take on, drawing a foul. DC United's actually doing well, a lot better than St. Louis in this regard, in creating those opportunities per 90 minutes. DCU's averaging just under 30 shot creating actions per 90, and St. Louis is averaging just over 23. So there's a pretty, there's a little bit of a difference here in how many chances are created. And that does lead into DC United having a high expected goals. So it goes almost hand in hand with the success that DC's had in their pressing that they are one of the leading chance creators in all of MLS. And statistically, Troy Lissen's side has 8.65 XG this season, which is good for third highest in MLS. They have a lot of shots. They create a lot of chances. They've taken the most shots in the league throughout their first four matches of the year, but they've only managed to score six goals this season. Three of them were in their first game. They were shut out against FC Cincinnati, and they haven't just, just haven't been able to manufacture a whole lot. 32.3% shot on target percentage is in the lower half of MLS. They have one of those highest number of shots to occur from outside of the penalty area. So you're seeing them build successfully, but they might not be getting the most high percentage chances in the box. They might be taking some speculative shots, not unlike we've seen with a Chris Dirk and here in the past few games. But this isn't to take away from what they're capable of in transition, but it does kind of provide a silver lining for St. Louis in that if you can prevent them in their transition from getting into the penalty box, they might be willing to take some of those speculative shots and low percentage chances that then St. Louis can either block, intercept, or turn around and create an opportunity for themselves. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I noticed about um, DC United uh, on some of the goals they scored, uh, was that they're always trying to find uh, Christian Benteke he missed a um, couple of games. The two the two away games he was out due to injury, but um, the the two games he played, um, like they're always looking for him and trying to uh, cross it to him in the box. Um, and uh, he's a very dangerous player. But um, I have a feeling that it, it City finds a way to uh, to neutralize uh, Benteke. Maybe this United will open up a little bit more and and try to. Uh, build from the back and city could be more effective with with the press but um but yeah definitely benteke one of the players to to watch and um it would be it would be an exciting game i'm looking forward to seeing that battle between benteke and uh, our center backs um that will be a very important battle during this game that might be my key battle to watch in this game. So before we get into the players, we've already mentioned Christian Benteke and what he's capable of. I think everybody knows the name. So what I'm looking forward to in this match, and this might be my matchup of the game, it's Christian Benteke against Joachim Nilsson. Knowing how Nilsson is capable, he's speedy to catch a player like that. He's not, he's not willing to let somebody beat him uh, in a line-breaking move. I want to see what Joachim Nilsson can do to neutralize Christian Benteke because some of the things that we're hearing is that if Bente as, as Benteke goes, so goes DC United. Now, we know that since he's been out, they haven't really found the, the winning side of the score sheet. 
And I think this is another opportunity in addition to some of the ones that we're going to talk about maybe in their fullback area and, and in their midfield that if St. Louis can really shut down Christian Benteke, some dominoes start to fall in that DC United attack. And, and so I go into what, how does DC United build? You know, what, what areas of the field do they try to prioritize? Uh, we know that St. Louis in the past couple of games, at least without Eddie Leuven, um, they've leveraged Thomas Totlin on the right side and tried to build through the right or they let Celio Pompeu uh, carry the ball on the left. And with Nicholas Dewar coming on potentially to see more minutes against DC United, that creates a, some you know evening out possibilities of our fullbacks. And, and so it creates interesting matchups, not just Benteke against Nilsson, but looking at how DC United is coming into this match and what St. Louis has been able to build on in these past few matches. So do you see a particular area of the field that St. Louis – maybe better serve to focus on when it comes to these these matchups in possession well st louis has st louis has weapons on on both sides um so totland on the right uh, which uh, as you mentioned uh city like lean on him um in the last game when el lewin was out but you also have celio on on the other side so uh so i think uh, there are strengths on on both sides, one thing um, that this United is going to be missing is uh, Aaron Herrera because he mm -hmm. he is with uh, his national team. So maybe since he's out, maybe there will be more opportunities um, to attack uh, with Celio on that left side. And it's not just Aaron Herrera who's out. So that's a great seg into just... We know who St. Louis is going to be missing, Edu Leuven and Tim Parker at least, uh, assuming nothing else happens between now and kickoff. But who's DC United going to be missing? And it's not just their right back, Aaron Herrera, who has been one of, if not the most important players. I mean, he his his impact to DC has been like Thomas Totlin for St. Louis. But DC United is also going to be without midfielder Mati Pol Poltola, who's going to be on national team duty for Finland. They're going to be without their left back, Pedro Santos, who got a red card in the last game against Inter Miami. So he'll be serving his suspension. They're without both of their starting fullbacks. They're without one of their midfielders. And this is a team that has shown a desire to build through the wings, especially on that right side. The formations they run out, the, the way that they progress the ball, one of those principles of overloading certain sides, it all starts from their fullbacks. And so coming in without both of their starting fullbacks has to be seen as uh, just a huge, uh, not just issue for DC United, but a huge opportunity for St. Louis City. So you mentioned Celio Pompeu. We just talked about Thomas Totlin, AZ Jackson, Indiana Vasilev, whoever's on the right side. There's big opportunity there because you assume that they're not going to change their overall style and the way they want to impose the ball, but the quality is going to be lacking. And that's that's what you have to see as an area of opportunity for St. Louis do you think that they, or should they target their fullbacks a little more so than normally trying to progress the ball through a little higher on their wings? Yeah, yeah, although Bradley Carnell, he was asked about that today. Uh, mm -hmm. He was asked specifically about uh, Aaron Herrera, um, but um, obviously Bradley Carnell said, well, yeah, he's, he's out. Uh, he's not going to be there, but uh, he was like, we don't, like uh, when we look at, at teams, uh, it's not so much about a player. It's most, more about uh, what the style of play and and how the team progresses the ball, regardless of of the players. Um, but yeah, I think uh, as you said, the quality is going to um, be a little bit lower. So um, yeah, definitely that right right side um, could be vulnerable with with Celio and with either uh, Nicolas Duor or Anthony Marcanic. So um, I think there is an opportunity there, but at the same time, uh, you have Thomas Tottenham on the other side. So you can just run uh, something balanced. Although when we talk about about the match on Sunday morning, we always see like a uh, one side, uh, one side with with more uh, play and with with more uh, possession. Uh, but I think City has a way to attack on on both wings uh, with guys who are playing well um so um if something is not working on one side you can easily switch to um the other side 
And so what's DC United going to look like without some of those players? And if you assume that Troy Lissan not going to change up his philosophy uh, like Bradley Carnell wouldn't, knowing that you know certain players aren't available, um, you look to what, what their formation is going to be and how, are they, how do they historically uh, hurt opponents. And whether it's Cheyenne or Jose, they both had told us it's likely going to be some form of of a 442 that either looks like a, maybe a 4321, a 4132, a 4213 with Benteke up top. They they seem like they have a similar mindset to, to the way the city's formations take shape in that defensively they look one way, but when it's in the offensive uh, zone, they will either uh, collapse on certain areas, they will send four or five guys forward into the attacking third. And so the shape outside of Christian Benteke is very fluid. And we've seen Jared Stroud being used on the right side a little bit more. He's He played both sides for St. Louis City, and we know that mm-hmm. he can play both sides. And he, he works well with overlapping fullbacks and with that pressing system. And so you look to their, their overall shape, and DC United seems to have been staying very narrow, looking to force into some of those central areas where they can overload the midfield, putting some pressure on the opposition to force a pass wide from the center backs or fullbacks. And so they like to have these, these overloads on the wide areas. And so when a ball is played forward to a winger on a touchline, you look to how St. Louis might try to progress the ball out on the wing. Uh, DC will press with Jared Stroud. They'll press with a fullback on the right side. They'll put pressure on those two forcing areas. They'll bring in their center defensive mid uh, to be able to kind of nip and try to take possession centrally. And then the other thing I've noticed is that Troy Lassen always tries to keep numerical advantages he holds that zone in the central area. And so if you look at the heat maps, there's a lot more gray, there's a lot more blue indicating higher percent possession in the central areas for Troy Lassen's side versus St. Louis City, always creating those overloads, whether it's in the press, whether it's in, uh, in, in on the ball, he's always trying to take those advantages that a 4-1-3-2 or a 4-3-2-1 shape can offer, getting narrow and trying to keep huge overloads on one side. So that's why I kind of look at how a Nicholas Dewar or a Salio on the opposite side might be very impactful and how quick we can look to a guy like Chris Durkin to redirect the ball. Will we see more switches from St. Louis because DC, not unlike St. Louis, but DC really does like to create these overloads on their side. So the moment you can either force a turnover or break through that, you know, you might be looking to take advantage of where they've committed and leverage the other side. So how effective can St. Louis be in working the ball on both sides? And will it stay within themselves in progressing the ball quickly? Yeah, that's that sounds really interesting. Uh, it, will be, it will be really interesting to see City uh, like switching the ball from, from side to side. Um, I haven't seen that a lot this year, mm-hmm. but we saw... Uh, that um a few times last year but but yeah it's a it's a good it's a good element that maybe city will implement uh for this game uh it's still staying within the principles but uh yeah when you're playing at least the way i see it, when you're playing somebody who has a similar style you have to uh make some adjustments uh to make you look a little bit different and and have a uh, that element of surprise and that could be one of them and in, in a game like this, I mean, you kind of have to look for how you can outsmart the opponent, right? Because both both St. Louis City and DC United, the way that they play, we just talked about so often, the way they play are so similar in what they try to do against the ball and what they have been trying to do on the ball. So if, if this isn't going to be teams that can both have 35, 40% possession, hmm. you know, who's going to be willing to do something a little different to pull out... Uh, something from your trick book to say, we haven't shown this look yet, but we're here, we're willing to, we're capable, and we can beat you a different way. Maybe this is the good opportunity that St. Louis has, not just because DC is missing some of those critical pieces, but just playing a team that tries to do the exact same thing. It's not like the LA Galaxy game. It's not like both teams are going to play their style and we're just going to see who's better at it. Mm-hmm. Both teams can't play a 40% possession style. Both teams can try to high press, but... At some point, somebody has to have the ball and somebody has to move the ball into the attacking third. So how can St. Louis beat this high press that uh, Jared Stroud is going to help to implement? And how can they attack 
people like Lucas Bartlett, who's taken over that center back role and know it, maybe knowing some of the tendencies from both of these players who have been so critical to DC United success early on the season is a benefit for St. Louis, but you could, I guess, argue the same thing with Chris Durkin on DC United side. So knowing the, the key thing about these three players, as we start to take a look at some of the more important people in this matchup, do you think that, who do you think really has the advantage having Jared Stroud and Lucas Bartlett come back to city park while Chris Durkin is playing his former team? I mean, is there an advantage by either team in this? Maybe, maybe DC United, um, uh, has the advantage. Uh, mm. and I, I actually, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you why, uh, I asked Carnell, uh, during the press conference, if, uh, like, uh, having Chris Durkin, like was good for the scouting, um, this United's players and he said, well, it's a new coach. It's a new style. Like, yeah, he, he can help like with some individual, uh, characteristics, but, um, the fact that it's a different system, um, something that they weren't doing last year, um, is definitely a difference maker. But when you think about, about Stroud and Barlett being there and, and knowing, uh, from last year, how, um, City plays and uh, it's two players on two different positions. One is a center back, uh, Stroud is a winger, so they can provide a lot of input about different areas and they know uh, their former teammates very well. O on mm -hmm. the other side, uh, this United had a lot of turnover, so uh, there are a lot of players that um, Dorking uh, may not be familiar with. So at least from that standpoint, I will say DC has a slight advantage. That's a fair point, given the overall familiar familiarity. It's not just about those three players, and that's important to remember. That's a really good point, because how many times have we talked, last season especially, where the press conferences during the week, it would be Carnell sending out, uh, or, or the team sending out somebody who is familiar with the opponent, who has history with the opponent, and we've talked to them about, you know, how much have you given insight or intel to the team? That might not be the case for what Chris Durkin can offer. That's a very good point because not just of the turnover in players, but the overall style is so vastly different from Troy Lassen. And so if you if you take the scouting reports at face value of DC has the advantage, um, maybe there is some, some value to City on just how important Jared Stroud and Lucas Bartlett have become for DC United. Because talking to both Cheyenne and Jose, Jared Stroud and Lucas Bartlett are key pieces to the 2024 DC United team. Stroud has been a promising addition. Bartlett, too. They're both thankful for the trade overall. I think they're they're really liking the pieces that, that they put together around Stroud and Bartlett. Stroud in particular, Jose has said that he's slowly building to be a key piece in the attack. He scored against Miami. We know something that Troy Lassen had told him he needed to do to break out of his scoreless streak. The relationship that Stroud has with Christian Benteke, with Gabriel Pirani over in the midfield has been working extremely well. Christian Benteke raves about Jared Stroud, apparently. And we've already seen some success build from all of those relationships in the attack. And they're expecting Jared Stroud to play as important, if not a more important role for them than he did with City last year. And on the defensive side, Santi, Lucas Bartlett has really fit in well on that center back line. The partnership with Chris McVeigh has been extremely effective. And Jose says it's going to take a lot for Steven Birdbaum to reclaim his spot back in that starting 11. And they're calling Lucas Bartlett the steal of that trade. And seeing him have four starts to start the season and already approach some numbers that he had with City last year, it really seems like this trade has worked especially well for a guy like Lucas Bartlett. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. He he has been really good with with this United uh, starting in every game, as you mentioned. And I um, I was talking to to somebody this week, and I think um, City had to just uh, include Barlett in order to to get Dorking. But uh, he was he had a good season with with City last year, and mm -hmm. towards the end um, when he was with City too, he got injured and didn't really get a lot of chances to play after that but um he was he was good when when his number was called when uh i was actually thinking of like a lot of us were probably thinking about him when when um the team was dealing with all those center back injuries um a, a week or two ago and um it was like okay last year there were a lot of center backs there was a lot of competition and now uh that they are not here 
the team uh, is struggling with injuries and having someone like, like Bartlett would have been great. But um, yeah, I think just in order to get Dorkin, I think the team had to uh, include him as part of that deal. But uh, he, he's taking that opportunity. Uh, I have been keeping an eye on, on what this United had, has been doing just because I knew City was was going to play uh, play them. But mm-hmm. the first thing I, I look when I look at the scores and the stats and lineups is if Lucas Bartlett and Jerry Stroud started. And uh, I was actually um, watching a little bit of their first game um, this afternoon, um, kind of in preparation for, mm-hmm. for Saturday for the broadcast. And uh, I really like what I saw from from both of them. Uh, Stroud had a great chance to um, score, uh, but um, it ended up hitting at uh, the upright. And uh, but uh, he will have he will have broken that streak earlier. But both of them look look good on on that half of playing that time that I saw. And I think one of the things that Jared Stroud has had success in uh, this season so far is the play off of Aaron Herrera, the wing back or the full back on the right side. And so I'm really interested to see how successful Jared Stroud can be navigating the channels on the right side or inverting and allowing the wing back to overlap if Aaron Herrera is not there. So this to me is a good test to see um, how well Jared Stroud is fitting in that system with players of or, or greater than his quality around him that can create for him, which Herrera has been excelling at. You look at the stat leaders and it's not, it's Christian Benteke obviously is leading goal scorer. He has three from that first game. Hasn't scored since though, which you mentioned he missed a couple games, but you look at who's creating these chances. You're looking at Aaron Herrera. He has two assists. He leads the team and he has seven key passes, which leads the team. So if you're, if you're missing that key cog in how distribution comes mainly on Jared Stroud's side, that's going to be a really key thing for me to watch is how effective Jared Stroud can be without that high-level Aaron Herrera to complement him. And then you look at maybe how the ball is going to be progressed. If they're playing out of the back, Mateus Kleek, their midfielder, and Lucas Bartlett are one and two in passes and pass completions. So we talked about how they like to high press, but at the same time, they're not they're willing to build out of the back. And so their midfielder who plays deep, their center back who can spray the ball out and choose to to direct that. I mean, that's how they play. And we're not we're not unfamiliar with that the way that Leuven or Blom or Durkin and especially Tim Parker has been acting as center back. So there's a lot of similarities in how they they like to start their progression. But I keep going back to missing Aaron Herrera is going to be such a huge piece. Um, earlier in the week when I was reaching out, they really called Aaron Herrera the guy that has has driven this offense. He's speedy in that winger role. He's got a good relationship with the attackers. The service is elite. So if, if they're missing these pieces, if they're not going to have that level of service, that speed, where are they going to try to find success on the ball? Any ideas if there's somebody else or maybe maybe they're just going to go back to the well of what we can expect this DC United team to build from knowing that they're missing these players. Yeah, and, and not not only not only um uh, Aaron Herrera uh is missing, but uh uh you also mentioned uh Mari Peltola who is uh, mm-hmm. with the uh with Finland and uh, he's one of the new guys but um he uh, he has been an important piece in, in the midfield. He's a DP. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it looks like he has adapted quickly and he has been important too. So uh, missing two um, key players, yeah, could be one of those things. Uh, maybe the same men- mentality that City has, like next man up uh, and see who who will step up. But, um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see if Stroud gets a partner on that right side that uh, can provide like the same service and partnership that... Um, Herrera has been providing so far. Santi, you want to start looking at some uh, potential starting lineups? I don't know if you have yours picked out, but we did receive a a likely DC United starting lineup from Jose. He's, again, speculating with missing players, and and you're going to see some names there and hear some names you probably aren't familiar with, but they're fully expecting Alex Bono to be in goal. They're going to run that 4-1-3-2, 4-3-1-2 type formation where your defenders are going to be Connor Antley, Lucas Bartlett, Chris McVeigh, and Garrison Tubbs. So seeing uh, Connor Antley and Garrison Tubbs fill in for those left and right back spots that they're missing, midfielders of Mateus Kleek, 
Martin Rodriguez, Gabriel Pirani, and Jared Stroud. Again, you're missing key pieces there um, who are off on international duty. You're having your attackers be Christian Benteke and Christian uh, Dahomey. So you see these names, you see the missing cogs. What do you think this overall starting 11 might look like for St. Louis? Is it something that we, we should expect a lot of similarities to? I mean, you mentioned next man up philosophy. Is this really a lineup with Garrison Tubbs and Connor Antley? I don't know much about them. I'm not going to pretend to know much about them, but I do know that they haven't played a whole lot. It has not been one of those we're keeping them fresh so that they can take over when international breaks hit. It really does seem like a drop-off in quality that DC is going to bring into St. Louis. Yeah, uh, I don't know anything about them either. Um, but yeah, just the fact that they haven't had much playing time could be uh, an advantage for for City on, on either side uh, with Celio or with Totland and... Mm -hmm. um, if Basilev plays on the other side, uh, they could uh, take advantage of uh, maybe uh, those um, left and right backs not not having played much um, this year and maybe not not having a lot of familiarity with uh, with their teammate teammates in uh, in real game situations. Obviously, they they train together, but uh, when it comes to um, the actual game, things can be a little bit different. But um, but yeah, you never know. Um, and as Carnell said, like yeah, we like we we're, we're not so much about the names. It's more about what the team does and, and how right. they play. Um, so so yeah, uh, without knowing much about these players, I I wouldn't venture into saying that uh, that this game will be uh, like a loop sided on for on city side. Uh, but but yeah, definitely some some things that that city could try to uh, exploit for sure and i i do think it's a that's a good uh reality check is that just because we're not familiar with some of these players connor antley garrison tubbs martin rodriguez that doesn't mean that they don't have the quality to step in you know i don't want to be overlooking who this is while at the same time being optimistic by the fact that some of those quality fullbacks aren't in the lineup you know if they're anything like st louis with the next man up philosophy they're just as likely to put out starting caliber fullbacks in their place. And so that's definitely the, the take this, take these missing pieces with a grain of salt perspective. I like a St. Louis lineup against this. That is as fast as they come. I want speedy players to get in behind these fullbacks because I'm fully expecting DC to stick with that same exact philosophy where you push your fullbacks high, you try to create the overloads with your attacking wingers. And so doing that, could leave them vulnerable if we're successful in our counterattacks. And so my lineup will consist of Berkey and Nett, Nicholas Dewar getting his first start at left back, Joachim Nilsson, Josh Yarrow, Thomas Totlin makes up the back line, Chris Durkin and Thomas Ostrak back in the midfield, Salio Pompeu and AZ Jackson as our attacking wide mids, Klaus and Sam. I like whether you call it a 4-2-3-1, whether you call it a 4-4-2, I like having Sam. Salio, AZ, Nicholas Dewar, Thomas Totlin, Thomas Ostrak, all in the lineup at the same time. I know I'm missing Indiana Vasilev. I know I'm putting out Klaus and Sam together. There's a lot that we can shift to in the second half with this look, but I think if you give these players with all the speed that they can afford and, and the playmaking abilities of Salio and AZ a 60-minute run or so, I think that will offer a lot against this DC United team. What do you think? I have, um, yeah, I, I don't have the same lineup, but um, it's it's similar. So uh, I have Berkey. Then um, I I have Markanig starting. I, I think yeah. Nicolas Dur, Nicolas Dur look good, but uh, I think uh, Markanig uh, deserves uh, another chance. Uh, so I'm gonna stick with Markanig there. Then uh, Nilsson and and Josh Jaro, Thomas Totland on on the right side. And then uh, we get to see uh, Dorkin and, and Ostrak uh, together again. I think that partnership worked well um, last week. Uh, and um, I think Thomas Ostrak is, is growing into mm -hmm. that role. Then um, Celio and I have Indy starting. And then uh, AC. And uh, this time I'm going to have Sam starting instead of Klaus. 
You know, I, I like the so we can we can argue and we can debate the uh, indie, the Klaus, AZ, say all those attacking players. But I want to talk about Thomas Ostrak for a second because you you really hit the nail on the head of his growth uh, in that number eight role centrally. One of the one of the issues that we had seen previously, especially as it relates to Ostrak and AZ, is that when they had seen time earlier in the season and even in preseason they seemed like they were collapsing space amongst them. They didn't really have the positioning down pat. But this past game against the Galaxy, I the goal that Tomas Ostrak scored, I mean, that is picture-perfect spacing in AZ and, uh, and was it Klaus or Sam? I forget who was there. I think it was Klaus. But both yeah. of them were right next. Yeah, both of them were next to each other. And you had Ostrak pop right through the middle. I mean, knew his responsibility, knew the spacing with AZ as that second striker. That worked phenomenally. So if we have something similar where your lineup might, I mean, you might have, you might win the consensus starting 11 we put out this weekend uh, because I, I could see that where you have AZ and you have Sam as those two strikers and then Ostrak has that space. Maybe that's the X factor in the offense where you're getting that, those push points working so well with Ostrak there. Uh, you let Indy, work out on the right side and you use AZ more as a second striker. I like that a lot. I'm talking myself into it here. I can, <laughs> I can absolutely see that working, but I still like the speed. I mean, the speed is still there. And that's, I think one of the absolute key things, not just controlling the midfield, but taking advantage of some of those wing areas. So all that said, score predictions. And I'll, I'll say that both people that I talked to from the DC side gave a one, one score independent of each other. So one, one, I one to one. Mm-hmm. I think they're going to be happy with the draw. I, I know they're going to fight. They're going to try to get as much as they can. But this is a, a same type of a scenario that St. Louis had in the past two games going into you know both of our away matches uh, against Austin, against LA. A draw away in MLS is good. Do you think we can put the rain on their parade and pull this out at City Park? Yes, um, definitely. At least for me, it's going to be... a. City win and and yeah, this United is gonna is gonna put a good fight and uh, I think um, it's gonna take a while for for City to uh, break it down. But uh, I'm going with a two zero another uh, clean sheet for Roman Berkey. Two zero, I like that a lot. I think I'm gonna go. I'm feeling optimistic about this. You know, you you tried to bring me down there for a minute, Santi. <laughs> But I'm going to go 3-0 St. Louis. I think I, I liked what we saw of, against LA. I think we can build on it. And I like Roman Berkey every single game of the year. And so I'll, I'll get his, uh, his next clean sheet, second one of the season, against this DC United side. Santi, any last words for this match going into the weekend? No, just looking forward to uh, being back at, at City Park. Uh, it's been a, a while and, and also... Uh, getting back to uh, winning uh, obviously two great uh, results playing away but um, now the team needs to uh, start um, getting three points and um, just uh, start a winning a streak at city park couldn't agree with you more i think this is going to be our weekend to get back on track in the winning column and city park is always a fortress can't wait to be back there can't wait to hear your goal calls i hope we get to hear a bunch of them santi Thank you for joining us here on Flyover Footy. My name is Matt Baker for Santiago Beltran. We thank you so much for joining us. We love that you've joined us in the chat on our live stream when we're doing this. If you're listening to us on the Big 550 KTRS, thank you so much. Check out our podcast, like and subscribe it if you get the chance. Really appreciate it. Um, for now, we'll leave you with that and go City. All right, Santi. So everybody on the live stream, thank you so much for joining us. We're not going to do a wind down this week. Obviously, I am not at my house. Um, you know, there we could go on and on about the U.S. Open Cup. I think I'm on borrowed time with a sick kid in the other room. So we're gonna we're gonna call it at that for tonight. We'll be back on Sunday for the fallout. And yeah, Santi, thanks for joining me tonight. Yeah, I'll see you. If I don't see you Saturday, uh, I'll see you Sunday for sure. That's right. We'll see you. Bye, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody.